the other books that I've researched, um, they're basically, and you guys are going to be like, duh, um, that they said the yogis got it right. So yoga really is a practice for toning both um, the ventral vagus and specifically the breath techniques, ujjayi, breath of fire, um, nadi shodhana, um, alternate nostril breathing, like those tone the ventral vagus nerve and the dorsal, the back one as well, promote these sort of pro-social engagements, uh, you know, heart-centered, where we can sit down and not be in our bodily traumas so that we can really connect as humans. This is the Beware How Show, mystic philosophy made practical. There are many paths up the mountain, and we're just pointing at a few of them. I'm Bob Peck, speaking with Scott Stanley, Brian Paget, and Melina Kiriaki. We are conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible. According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. Hi. I'm Bob Peck, and this is the Beware How Show, speaking regularly with Scott Stanley, Ryan Padgett, and Melina Kiriaki. The Beware How Show covers mystic philosophy, making it practical. We like mindfulness, metaphysics, and non-duality. A big part of the show is untangling misconceptions around spirituality. Today is Sunday, December 13th, and we have the amazing Marie Young on today. Hi, Marie. Thanks for joining Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a lovely intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, it's just begun. Uh, there's more <laughs> intro. Great. Um, thrilled to have you. It's Ryan's birthday today. So happy birthday, Ryan. Hi. We yes. love you. It does not surprise me that we have all these gorgeous Sagittarians in, in your um, tribe. They're all Sagittarius. We're all. <laughs> it's Bob and Sagittariuses. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Oh, the so Ryan's a Sag, Melina's a Sag, and Scott's I am. A yep. Yes, I uh, love me some Sages because they um, there is a great just a, uh, a lean towards a lean in towards spirituality. Mm. So, mm. and Bob, I know you and I have talked that book I told you about the Agape one. Uh, Sir John Templeton, he was a Sag, and you know he looked at this underlying. Uh, agape under you know the devotional love and service love under all religions so beautiful sages are great so you're not surprised <laughs> that i'm stuck with all these sagittarius's yeah well, i thought it was just a coincidence that we were all on this show but i guess not <laughs> i know i love it i dig it it makes sense though bob that you're the communicator because you're a gemini right yeah i'm on the cusp of gemini and cancer yeah which I feel like I've really sat with that. And so Gemini is like two, it's the twin. It's like yeah. two aspects of yourself. Mm -hmm. But it, but if you're on the cusp, then you have two aspects of two different signs. So mm -hmm. I, there's just a lot of layers to me. Yeah, and that makes there sense. Is. A con there in is, a confusing there way. Well, and I like, I'm on the air water cusp too. And there's this sense mm. of mist, you know, this sense of, of mm. um, just kind of radiating. Those two uh, elements. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, we're, we're even pre-bio, and that's already <laughs> interesting know, to me. I was going to say, we didn't even get into the bio yet, which is hilarious. <laughs> no, no. It's your fault, Sagittarius. It's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, bring the Sagittarius's. Personalities. <laughs> that's a great just bit for me now, is to blame the Sagittarius's. Um, <laughs> it's actually perfect and synchronistic that Marie is our last guest of the year, um, we had a quick little scheduling swap due to another guest um, who endured a loss. So our heart goes out to him and, and that community. Um, we will gladly have him on in 2021, but we all, we've been wanting to get Marie on uh, for some time. Um, Marie is a mentor to Melina and I, and we'll talk a lot about her, what she's done at Facebook and the Mindfulness Club. Um, but uh, it's perfect. The reason why, because of it being you're, you're the last guest of 2020 uh the wildest year on record and marie's <laughs> specialty is burnout and resilience 
And that's what she does. Uh, reading her bio here, Marie Young is a body-based coach who helps clients reach their goals by connecting with their bodies and souls first. She's been studying yogic practices for over 20 years, teaching for nearly 10. Marie empowers clients with grounding techniques and coaching tools so they can live their lives with purpose, passion, and focus. She writes, I kept digging and realized what worked for me was to incorporate practices that I could do almost any time that helped me to be in my body, primarily sounding and vagal nerve toning. Immediately, it was like, ah, life just got better. And I was reaching my goals more easily. These gave me, uh, these gave me that sense of relaxed com confidence and self-belief that are the backbones of reaching and sustaining any goal. And it helped my clients do the same. I'll empower you with grounding techniques and coaching tools so you can have more confidence to get that better job, improve your relationships, and become the empowered version of yourself. Really beautiful. Love your work. Thanks for jumping on. We're going to cover all this. Thanks so much, Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. Um, yeah. So tell us before you tell us more about your background, because we, we're going to cover a lot of concepts, probably philosophically. We're all into Hindu philosophy and Eastern uh, dynamics. Um, but I just wanted to say gratitude. Thank you so much for, um, you know, being a part of our Facebook club, Mindfulness Act Club. Uh, Marie has come into Facebook back in 2019 when we went to inside of a buildings with other people. Uh, that's when Marie came in and she ran several, uh, I think it was like almost six or eight or 10. It, she came in very often. We, she was coming in monthly um, for the second half of 2019 to lead singing bowl meditations. We had gigantic groups of people, 40, 50, 60 people who uh, you know, as we'll discuss, have extremely busy jobs and extremely busy lives and extremely busy minds. And so it was a very cool, um, you know, offering from Marie to our organization to be able to bring a little Tibetan flavor, a little uh, Himalayan peak to uh, the top of the Austin skyscraper. So um, <laughs> just thank you for, for how you've helped our org and our club and our own practices. Mm, you're welcome. Uh, it was such a pleasure. And, um, you know, we can definitely talk about sound. I think we all love the sound uh, portion of healing. And, um, you know, when we talk about philosophy, I can tell you a little bit about where sort of my, you know, the intellectual tie in to sound and why that works for me. But experientially, mm -hmm. I think we all know. And sound and breath work, I mean, they're definitely having a moment and they should because they're so vastly important and so e easily done. I think the portability of them is what continue, you know, like meditation, you kind of have to set aside, there has to be quiet, but I feel like sound mm. and breath, you can, you can do most anywhere that you have five minutes alone. <laughs> and yes, I have sure. been caught. That only accessibility. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that accessibility is yeah. why the why you do it, why your expertise. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell us, uh, yeah, Marie, tell us a little bit about your background, how you found this stuff. Um, I rem I remember some of your story from having conversations after those events, but um, but yeah, tell us more. I know you've studied under a variety of different yoga teachers, and it just mm. clicked for you. Yeah. Um, so started practicing yoga in Austin, uh, gosh, was the year 2000. Um, it was at Yoga Yoga, the now defunct Yoga Yoga, but um, it's unfortunate that happens. But, you know, if you look at it in the, the cycle of things, you know, there's creation and sustenance and destruction. And so I think that just kind of had its own cycle. But um, and just started out uh, doing Hatha and loved what it did to my nervous system. And finally I was like, oh, mm -hmm. wow, calms me down, does give that sense of peace. And not just peace, but connection. So that was sort of the first time I had, I think felt that in the body. Like I had always been pulled to um, uh, the spir spirituality, but there it, you know, yoga gives that bridge between the intellect and the heart, I think it does for me anyway, or did for me. So um, was doing Hatha teacher training and then got called to 
the West, the Los Angeles for, um, I was uh, also acting at the time and, um, uh, and uh, my ex was in, um, we had a film company together. So we went out to LA uh, because a lot of, a big group of our friends were out there. And in LA, I found this, mm. uh, this yoga studio that was an Anasara yoga studio. And Anasara mm -hmm. is um, really a non-dual tantric Kashmiri Shaivism school and um, the, and that philosophy. But beyond that, just the yoga, it was very heart centered, um, you know, Bob, you know, I've talked about bhakti, you know, that devotional moving from the heart, which mm. just was as someone I'm in my head a lot that that connection there was just really profound mm. for me. So sure. Yeah, did did the teacher training out there and, um, you know, started teaching immediately. And so the philosophy and, and Shakti and Shiva feature very prominently. They're the stars of <laughs> Kashmiri Shaivism. So um, so that's really the philosophy. And then I taught yoga and then that has segged into about three years ago, started teaching at Meditation Bar here in Austin, mm -hmm. which is really one of a kind in, I mean, you, you see meditation studios on the coasts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, but to see it, I think here, it's, it's one of a, a kind, I think in Texas, or at least it used to be, and they teach all forms of meditation. And then uh, my yoga teaching always had a huge meditative component and specifically a huge chanting component because that comes from Anasara. There's mm. an opening in Bhakti. That's Bhakti. Yeah, yeah, Bhakti, yeah, Kirtan and so forth, so. I love that it's called the meditation bar. Like in Austin, we drink so much that they're like, it's, yeah, it's a bar, right. kind of like just. It's, like, it's a good, it's a good technique to get yeah. people interested. to lure people in. It is. We talked about it. Uh, it's undergone a couple of different changes in ownership, and the the last owner, he and I were were pretty close, and and we talked about it as like the tagline. It, it's a different kind of spirit, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. Got to yeah. make the spirit jokes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Different so colors. But yeah, a lot of people are like, you work at a bar? You, yeah. It's like we drink and then we meditate. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's actually how we connected originally. Yeah. If you remember three, was it three years ago? Yeah. When we were at the wellness, the wellness. Expo expo that south by southwest throws on mm. and i was introduced to you and just everything with your work and i immediately connected with you yeah. and we just hit it off and i mean and then i started coming to your classes at the meditation bar and we you know connected through there and then i mean everything with facebook it's been amazing yeah um, but it's beautiful hearing like your whole story coming from doing your yoga teacher training in California then coming over here and then and then what brought you to the meditation bar how did that introduction come to be you know I just looked it up I looked up meditation studios uh, mm. because I wanted to kind of sag from teaching yoga which I, I definitely love um, I think the call for hatha yoga in the wet you know in the west has changed a little bit um, and then you know as I'm getting older like I can't do the the let's do ashtanga for 90 minutes a day like that kind of practice is just not my I can't do it anymore. now so i get that yeah i understand <laughs> yes <laughs> um i think there's a huge place for that and you know it's it's fantastic uh, and it can really get you out of your head like your mm -hmm. the presence of your body and, and 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 just um hanging on for dear life and some of those practices are <laughs> great for that but um yeah. Yeah, so it just uh, I um, was just looking at that and and I was amazed that there's this standalone meditation studio. Uh, mm -hmm. So I went in and the lady there um, who was managing it, Krista Lee, is a, a profound mentor to me. And uh, she and I just hit it off kind of like Melina and I hit it off. It was like from across the room <laughs> by each other. Oh, and there was this light the and uh, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, it's just a nice meeting of the minds and yeah. um, just talked about, I mean, <laughs> really talk about Shakti is this creative force behind everything. And there's not, you know, Shiva is in this realm as a container for that, but, you know, just all over the place, kind of all different 
um, we, you know, threads that, mm -hmm. that wove us together in this meeting of the minds. So, yeah. So, uh, she was like, you need to come teach here. And I was like, I believe that you are correct. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think you are onto something. So I, I just started and, um, you know, I'd looked at, at mindfulness, meditation, um, sounding, um, you know, have experimented with a lot of different types and um, have, I've really gotten a lot out of everything. I mean, there's just so much out there and so much that can, can be of great assistance. Mm -hmm. um, again, what works for me tends to be body-based practices. So chanting and sounding um, especially, uh, but, um, uh, I know Bob, you know, I've talked about open awareness. I mean, that's also fantastic for my mind because my mind has so much going through it. I think it, all of ours do. Um, and to not have to clamp that down and be like, mm -hmm. you are wrong because your mind is very active. You know? Totally. And useful disclaimer too. I think, uh, you know, kind of a common theme on the show and like, I feel like I'm always talking about it just everywhere to everyone, but you know, the kind of myth busting or debunking around mm -hmm. meditation and how, um, you know, I think too much, I have too many thoughts is not for me or, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of common, um, misconceptions and, you know, to your point there, there's such a wide variety of types of meditation. I'm going to be quoting Richard Davidson later. I already like pull up quotes of his, but he's already relevant in that. He says meditation is like sports. There's yeah. it's there's a extremely wide variety of and there's different, you know, it's like there's different activities, different mm -hmm. skill sets, there's different flavors. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah, I think some one thing I've realized recently is mindfulness meditation in particular sometimes can be a little cold to me you know i love headspace we love andy um but some like if i do that for three months by month four i'm like i gotta do some some meta i gotta do some loving kindness meditation and really that's what ignites my uh interest in it. and that's part of that what you're talking about with the bhakti and the devotional and the love and so on like yeah. there's there's kind of heady focused ones there's heart focused ones there's body and psychosomatic and all these different flavors and so mm. you know the more you come into these traditions uh you can really see that you can see the spectrum and that's what you're 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 a, you know a scholar of is, is you're always reading about different varieties and different flavors that's so interesting yeah mm -hmm. oh that's beautiful um yeah the loving kindness one boy that that you just reminded me like it's time to kind of get back to that yeah. i know uh, there's a lot out there and tell me what you guys think. Um, you know, it's that whole thing. Like you got to pick one and stick with it for yeah. a long time. Um, and I have done that. It's probably been more open awareness, just kind of, but again, always coming back to the breath and diaphragmatic breathing. And um, I mean, one of the huge people I follow and Melina knows this is uh, Sally Kempton and her big thing is about felt sense. You know, you feel it in your body, you feel it in your heart. And that's, I just kind of pass that on to my students, like the sensate, you know, feel the sensations of your breath, because mm -hmm. if you're feeling the sensations of your breath, mm. you're more likely than not, not being totally in your thoughts, you know? So just the loving kindness really helps, helps to, to open the door to that, that feeling realm, um, which has worked well for me, but yeah. Um, directing yeah, attention to the yeah. sensation yeah exactly and so i don't know what you guys think how long you've have you picked one and stuck with it for years or <laughs> like i haven't been able to do that like i think the longest has been i tend to change them quarterly with the seasons actually yeah. mm. that kind of supports that's uh, interesting me. yeah i mm -hmm. i can add to this but i can go last Okay. <laughs> I know Bob's all about the loving kindness meditations yeah, and it's so beautiful. Thing. Like his heart chakra is just always bursting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will say though, um, and I love that about you, Bob. I actually, so I do resonate with the loving kindness, but not as deeply as Bob does. Again, it's so beautiful. I'm more of an open awareness gal, more of like the um, kind of trying to be, 
not in autopilot or monkey mind and recognizing the thoughts and recognizing just coming back to the present moment. Um, but I really resonate with what you said in terms of just picking in different flavors, going into a mixture of all of them, because you're right, I feel like there's different ones that speak to my energy at different times of the day, or to your point, the season's changing. Mm. Um, my favorite my favorite piece of that is what you've taught me about the body practicality and feeling the breath and then the chanting, so I definitely want to get into that. Mm. Um, but I'm curious, Bob and Scott, about your practices as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add because I'm the least experienced of all of us when it comes to this. But my my favorite practice uh, was from a, a teacher of ours we had in Chicago who taught yin yoga. Mm -hmm. And um, she did such a good job of it. She like just the mental side of it as we were going through the, um, the poses and um, just the way she described the connection between, you know, your body and mind as we were going through them. And that's kind of I've I've only dabbled compared to to y'all, but that 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 type of uh, practice really really um, connected with me. <laughs> I, I got a lot out of it. Your practice is also humility, Scott. That's your side of my brother. Um, <laughs> no, I I have a lot of thoughts on this subject because I have been guilty of. Um, I mean, a, a spiritual mentor I mentioned him before, our Apache friend. Uh, we'll sometimes call it spiritual indigestion. If you mm -hmm. go to the spiritual buffet line and mm -hmm. you can fill up, you really can. Uh, so I do want to caution. I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's a, especially when you're just learning about all these different paths and all these different techniques, there is a value. And that's what this show is doing. And that's what kind of our, our writing projects are trying to do is, is point people to say, hey, there's all these different kinds. Um, mm -hmm feel and experience and get a flavor of uh and mm. then dig in um you know because the contrast to that is i think it was ramakrishna who said um digging many shallow wells doesn't get you the water but one deep well is what gets you the water so i you know mm. it's tricky I, I do see the benefit in really sticking with one and writing it out and like going through the phases of it but it mm. should resonate with you. You shouldn't. It shouldn't be a forced uh, sentiment or flavor to that practice. It should be something that really speaks to you and resonates with you. So there's, mm -hmm. I think there's kind of a two phases. There's a there's a selection process where you are open, and then there's a uh, dig in process. Is that would yeah. be my take. I will add, though, that it might not resonate the first couple of times, and that's what I like mm, the idea yeah. of writing it out, because it could, you know, it's almost like right. discovering. I totally agree, though. Yeah, but it's yeah. not ever like, do this for 30 days, and then on the 31st, you know, there's yeah. just no units of time that you can describe, <laughs> or at least I can't, right. you know, yeah. totally. Definitely. Yeah, I like that too. Um, I was going to make a joke. It's like, do anything for a long period of time as long as it's not mindfulness meditation, but I don't. I mean, I've done mindfulness. <laughs> I like mindfulness. And I remember when I was first starting, um, I did do I did do open awareness probably for six months straight. So, mm. you know, it is like I did do that period and I committed to that. So I think you're right. And I, I think there were boons from that. There are huge boons from it. So, um, yeah. And, and I don't mean to disparage, like, picking one. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. process, I think, of, like, really listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And really hearing if it's serving you or if it's yeah. not. And yeah. I think there is even a progression. I mean, back to Ramakrishna, he, he was all about the sadhanas of sadhana meaning practice in sanskrit it's like uh phases of belief and his, his life as an incarnation as a hindu saint saintly figure avatar even to some was that yeah. he was actually kind of proving out the validity of all the different paths so he was a uh kali uh devotee of the divine mother as a child mother relationship but then he did he was a muslim for a little while he was a christian he tried out different sects and different flavors and uh, it was kind of his way of like stamping all of them as approval although i would say he's like mostly a cali worshiper so i don't know i think i think uh you know listening to that hearing that being open to the changes of mm -hmm. of your practice yeah damn yeah, it yeah. 
Yeah, just I was gonna say, it. also our bodies are changing a lot. Like some things I, I realized when mm. I first started practicing, I did not resonate with loving kindness at all, but the way I resonate with it now is night and day. And I do think that it's mm. through the, the seasons of my body changing and, you know, yeah, going and things through happening different in your phases life. of life. Yeah, yeah. True. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think as well, and I know we'll get into it, but with your work on just resiliency in the body, Marie, but your specific, one of your offerings in your classes and just learning how the breath really affects your body mm. um, was a very big practice that I was recently, this year, introduced to, at least the importance of it, like the very big importance of it. So mm. I really appreciate that too. Oh, yeah, yay. tell us about that, Marie. Mm -hmm. I think what, what where it started uh, was that when I would do these chants in um, Anasara, we have the opening chant um, and it has a lot of ohms in it. And what I was noticing is I would get this and now I know what it is. It's an autonomic response. And you know, autonomic means you don't do it. It's like yawning. You don't, it's not something you initiate. It just happens automatically. And I was getting a lot of yawning and a lot of um, eyes watering more so than anyone else in class and I'm like oh I'm a freak which is fine I mean I'll I'll fly the freak, uh, the freak flag I'm okay with that but and I asked my teachers and they're like yeah we don't know you're a freak you know like they weren't like oh, we don't know and I think what was happening is the the chanting and the breath and and they go hand in hand because you chant, you chant on the exhale. And the great thing about chanting is that it elongates the exhale. And there's this, um, I think it's kind of a, a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to, in, incorrect thing, you know, like when you're kind of freaking out, people are like, take deep breaths, take a deep breath, you know, take a big inhale. Inhale actually is a sympathetic it, it engages us, right? It um, is a it lets the sympathetic nervous system know, hey, you need to be alert here. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the exhale that is when the parasympathetic, the the rest and digest comes in. So chanting elongates that. And I think maybe that was the first time that I was really working with the breath and getting the benefits from that. Beautiful. Um, yeah, and and regulating the nervous system. That's what, did that answer the question? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. That's Notice so you, interesting. I noticed you uh, mentioned the the vagal nerve specifically, which I was surprised by because I, I in the last few years, I had some like health issues uh, with my digestion and I had to learn all about that nerve because it was like going off like randomly, like uh, in spurts. And, and I had to learn oh, about, wow. you know, its connection to the immune system and like, it's con connection to what you eat and how you're feeling and, and it, and it regulates like your heart rate and, you know, like all these systems in your body. So I was just, I was, when you mentioned that specifically, I was curious what you've learned about it. <laughs> yeah. I've done a lot of, of research on the vagus nerve and um, there's a guy, Stephen Porges, he's a researcher. Um, so the vagus nerve has been around for a while and I mean, forever, obviously, but the, the work, um, ha, you know, the notion of toning high vagal tone is associated. It's like high muscle tone. You have a high vagal tone. It's a good thing. And there are things you can do to tone the vagus nerve. Um, and what poor just came in and said is that there's actually two branches of the vagus nerve. There's the ventral, which is stomach facing and the dorsal, which is on your back, like a dorsal fin. Um, you know, if anyone's new to the vagus nerve, it's cranial nerve 10. You know, we have all these nerves in our brain stem. Um, and, um, and it's the longest nerve in the body, the longest cranial nerve. And it extends, like you said, all the way down in, you know, it innervates on the back side um, and the front side, it'll innervate um, the heart, the lungs, um, and then the dorsal, the backside goes into the viscera, into the intestines, into the digestion. And it's the ventral that will innervate the face and the throat and the heart and the lungs. And by, by saying that there's two different branches, it allowed for a, a refinement of this notion of toning the vagus nerve. So a lot of my work is about toning the ventral vagus nerve with exercises and um, we'll do some 
at the at sort of later in the show, um, a guy who did a lot. He was he's a body worker. He's American, but he's out of Denmark. He did a lot on um, uh, social engagement and linking that with the ventral vagus nerve and um, toning that to help. This is where the resiliency work comes in. So. What I've done is I've taken the yogic practices. Oh, and in the other books that I've researched, um, they're basically, and you guys are going to be like, duh, um, that they said the yogis got it right. So yoga really is a practice for toning both um, mm -hmm. the ventral vagus and specifically the breath techniques, ujjayi, breath of fire, um, nadi shodhana, um, alternate nostril breathing. Like those tone the ventral vagus nerve um and the dorsal the back one as well um promote these sort of pro uh social engagement uh you know heart centered where we can sit down and not be in our bodily traumas so that we can really connect as humans and so wonderful yogananda would be so happy he everything he ever wrote was like the scientific methods yeah. of this practice that you know and it was like before the research, it was like, you know, yeah. he was writing 80 years ago. So um, it's yeah. Maharishi, scientific. Everything was scientific to uh, the Hindu uh, emissaries. And so it's beautiful uh -huh. that we now we had the technology to validate their techniques. So cool. Yeah, yeah. that's um, man, Yogananda, boy, something else. I was so lucky in <laughs> LA to go to his. So he has two, you know, shrines. I don't know if, if you, yeah. you talked about yeah, SRF there's ashrams, yeah. Yeah, ashrams, one in Hollywood, like in kind of the seedy ass part of Hollywood next to the Scientology <laughs> building, which is very interesting mm. and a story in itself. But then, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> one, well, I mean, you probably know this, like at that sort of in the early uh, 20th century, there were, a, and Yogananda was one of them, there were a lot of um, uh, Hindu people, uh, Hindu people, you know, Hindu sages that came and sort of hung out in Los Angeles and set up shop there. And unfortunately, sure. probably <laughs> Ron Hubbard the, was there Ron too. Ron Hubbard was riding the wave of new thought, and yeah, yes, absolutely, yes. all those guys. Well said, Gemini communicator. Very well said. So, um, <laughs> um, full circle. And, yeah, and then there's the one out in the Palisades, which is just gorgeous. So, glad you brought mm -hmm. him up because he is. It, it is it. Centenary. Yeah, his connection. He hmm? came here in 1920 to America. Uh, Yogananda did. That's right. Yogananda arrived in Boston in 1920. So. Who was the guy that got years here later. in 1890? Was that Vivekananda? That was Vivekananda. Yeah. That's Scott's. Um, who's Scott's hmm. called to lately? <laughs> yeah, I've been listening to a lot of his stuff. <laughs> He's uh, which I discovered. Yeah, Bob. Uh, you know, gave me Yogananda's book. Or, uh, years ago and which yeah would blew me away and but now i'm now i'm loving uh vivekananda as well but yeah there's there's a lot to dig into <laughs> there's yeah. so many of them and they're different but they're also all the same yeah they're all masks <laughs> of the one friends if, if you would like i can tell you a story about vivekananda an indirect story if you oh <laughs> yeah. tell us okay um so I love Sally Kempton and mm -hmm. I, I remember you talking about Bob, how you get, you tend to gift be here now and autobiography of a Yogi to people. So Melina will tell you what I tend to gift is awakening Shukti by, and I have it right here um, by Sally Kempton. Nice. Hmm. Mine's yeah. right over there. <laughs> and um, you, you know, gifted it to me. It yeah, I did. I did. Um, so she tell this is her story. So I want to give credit where credit is. But um, there's Shankara, right? And um, then you know Vivekananda is a, a follower of him. Um, uh, Ramakrishna, sorry. Vivekananda is Ramakrishna. Yes. Oh, really? So Alice says differently, but let. Well, well not, it's I'm, not Shankara. I'm reading this lately. Oh, okay, uh, and disciples. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is. Christopher Isherwood on Ramakrishna. Um, it's that amazing. Looks great. <laughs> I, well, and also, let me say, bef without being like corrective, annoying guy. Um, no, it's fine. Uh, Shankara was tw uh, 1200s or 900s. 
I can't. I need to look. Do you at know it what? Quick. You are absolutely right. I just checked yeah. this. Sorry. And and Vivekananda, Vivekananda, what it says in here, and I have it wrong, is that um, uh, you know there was Shankara and his Advaita Vedanta, right? And then right. Vivekananda, Vivekananda was a follower of that. So right. Maybe yeah, Shankara influenced everyone. Yeah. But it was like twelve hundred years ago. So. Yes. He wasn't a direct disciple. Uh, Vivekananda was a direct disciple of Ramakrishna, who was this illiterate ecstatic in the 1800s. And Vivekananda was the Oxford-educated communicator disciple of that illiterate, Ooh. brilliant genius. And so their relationship was really interesting in that he was kind of the, the vocalizer of the master who never left Calcutta, really. Um, but Vivekananda traveled the world and spoke in Chicago and all that. So Vivekananda was the mouthpiece for Ramakrishna. But Shankara, 1,200 years ago, influenced, he basically revolutionized Hindu philosophy. It was kind yeah. of in a dark period in that those days, and he revolutionized it, revitalized it, took some from Buddhism. Uh, aspects of Zen uh, are in Shankara's Advaita, non-duality, which we talk about on the show a lot. But yeah, so... Just want no. to clarify. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you. No, I appreciate that. Like, it gets a little bit confusing. And it definitely really, does. It's not really a story about Vivekananda. It's more about Shankara as told by Sally Kempton. And, you know, Shankara, so this is, and you can illuminate this for me, because I have listened to the podcast on Advaita Vedanta. Um, and it is a non-dual school, which, I mean, I think ultimately it, the non for me non duality is that the individual the um the absolute and kind of almost <laughs> everything in between the body especially they're not separate you know there is not two there is one non dual right in my personal opinion and i can't figure out because advaita vedanta says um or at least my reading of it is that there is the spirit and there is the world and we're looking for the spirit because the world has, uh, you know, it has Maya in it, right? So we have illusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the little demons of Maya are, uh, you know, Maya being a feminine concept. And then the demons of Maya are women. <laughs> so, you know, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a disconnect between men and women. And so I'm like, well, that's a little dual to me. So I feel like mm -hmm. non-dual sure. Tantra is a little more, or, or a little more non-dually than <laughs> Advaita. <laughs> Vedanta, right? So, um, mm, but, that's interesting. And, and, and according to Kempton, uh, Shankara had sort of an aha moment. Um, uh, you know, also Advaita, Advaita Vedanta is, it, it does have a world denying flavor to it. And I think what, what um, non-dual Tantra says is that the world is divine. The body is divine. Everything has divined. And it's not that you know, you can, you can be, um, not, not wholly about your, um, ad, approach to it, but instead of transcend, 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 it's refine, refine, refine. So, like I said, a lot of my work just comes from this foundation that the, the body is divine, that, mm. um, we're, we're here to refine it, not transcend it. And so some mm. of the practices that I have developed are about that or all of them. Beautiful. So, but well said. So uh, yeah, Shankara is, I, I know you'll like the story because you're a storyteller, Mr. Bob. Um, <laughs> we all, I mean, I think we all are really. Um, um, and so Shankara is uh, in South India walking around like he does and a river floods. And, you know, Shankara is like, I got this. Like, apparently he faced down some tigers, which that's not my bag, but, you know, <laughs> Shankara say. <laughs> So he faced, he's faced down some tigers. So he's like, I'm just going to wade into this flooding river just because. And uh, he gets to the middle of it and he, uh, his body just stops working. And, um, and uh, this is the first time in, um, you know, uh, a being, you know, very in touch with his own power in a good way, uh, his divine power. He, he hadn't experienced that before. So, um, so he's like, ah, oh, I got to do something. I'm going to drown. So he hears this cackle on the riverbank, this cackle. He looks over and you, there's this sort of crone forager woman kind of, you know, laborer who's like 
Creek uh, sort of bent over. She's cackling at him and he's like, what's going on? So he's like, help me, help me. So she looks at him dead in the eyes. She's like, and she cackles again. And then somehow she just, she wades into the river with her little, little person self and just like grabs him out, puts him on the shore and is like, Chakra, you have been denying your own life force, which is Shakti, in in denying the um, sacred feminine. And um, this denial of the life force um, is getting you in trouble. <laughs> so it has just gotten you in trouble. And so he had an, a very recognition moment, an aha moment. And um, the, the really cool, so he bowed to her, this old lady as, as an example of the goddess. And then in secret started being more tantra tantric in his uh, philosophy of embracing mm. the goddess, which is not about male, female, it's about, you know, um, divine masculine, feminine energies. So, um, I love it. and apparently around that time, it was in, in public, you worship Vishnu, and this is, you know, Hindu, you worship the Orthodox religion. Um, and then in private, you worship Shiva, which, you know, the deity of yoga and those, you bring in those practices, but in secret, you worship Shakti, which is, is the power behind all things, the, the creative power in the universe. So that is my Shankara story. Beautiful. It's Sally Kempton's book, which I am going to gift you and you're going to love. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing. I, I think yeah. there is a lot of, uh, difficulty really frankly as as i hesitate in articulating that there's a lot of difficulty in getting across the conceptualization around non-duality um because because yes. world denialism is isn't really it you know i think that could be conceptually on the face of it what people think it is but it's really um the projection it's the it's the projected world, but it's 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 reacting to the mind. It's it's uh, what the difference in Hindu philosophy is is the word real, right? Um, in Hindu philosophy, real means something that's eternal, something that is changeless, and something that is self-sustaining. Mm. And so this world ain't those things, and it it it's kind of a translation issue almost because you're like well what's it real is it really real you know it's like well it's just not those qualities it's but it's here we are uh you know i still set up my lighting thing and plugged in my mic and you know we're talking on this computer and like it, all those things are taking place but it's just it doesn't quite have the solidity that mm -hmm. we thought it did mm -hmm. the eternal yeah, yeah yeah it's just uh reducing emphasis on in some way you know yeah mm. i liked how you were describing too the it's 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 the the nature of real but also how we react to the illusion and you were talking about the difference of um it's not like a rejection but it's more of a refinement of the illusion and mm -hmm. and yeah. i've always struggled with that myself of like how do i how am i supposed to just like you know, ignore or reject everything. And that's just because that was my like simple understanding of, of non-duality and like what, what it implies. Um, but I like how I, I like your approach of that, you know, there, no, there are actually divine things to experience, but, but you have to kind of fight through the, the illusion to get to them. I don't know. I'm still, yeah. I'm still wrestling with that. This in is my a, own, so. This is a really yeah. great passage I wanted to read real quick. Uh, I think it's re relevant. Um, Ramakrishna, I was reading about Ramakrishna today because Marie and just getting a brush up and I came on this passage and it's really good. Uh, he was going through these sadhanas, these spiritual phases, mm -hmm. and um, like many people thought he was losing his mind and he kind of was. Um, and But it's related to like exactly what Marie was talking about and Scott was talking about. It says... Um, recalling this period, Ramakrishna used to say, quote, no sooner had I passed through one spiritual crisis than another took its place. It was like being in the midst of a whirlwind. Even my sacred thread was blown away. 
Sometimes I'd open my mouth, and it would be as if my jaws reached from heaven to the underworld. Mother, I'd cry desperately. I felt I had to pull her in, as a fisherman pulls in fish with his dragnet. A prostitute walking the street would appear to be Sita, going to meet her victorious husband, Rama. An English boy standing cross-legged against a tree reminded me of the boy Krishna, and I lost consciousness. Sometimes I would share my food with a dog. My hair became matted. Birds would perch on my head and peck at the grains of rice which had lodged there. Snakes would crawl over my motionless body. Oh. Um, so, you know, like the, the, the veil is blurring for, for, yeah. for that level of attainment. And that, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just no. related to what you were talking about. Yeah. I dig it. I don't know how the show and then how the pandemic, I was going to pose this for you guys. I am, you know, I say that about like, embracing the world as also divine which you know i think a, a huge case could be made for that um in in the shakti principle of uh kempton says that she created shakti created the world and then lived at, as the world in the world and then there's another way of looking at it like um shiva is he watches the play and then you know he is not a male it's a masculine um he watches the play and then Shakti creates all the parts and then plays the parts, you know, so it's, mm. it's just all this creative dynamism in the world, the power of creation, the things that humans create, which really are divine. I mean, the computer that we're, I mean, I'm amazed at technology, just the creative spark there, it, it always strikes me as divine. But there's so much creative activity. Um, and I think what meditation is seeking now, what it's offering, and mindfulness is great at this, is that it's a it's a Shaivic principle. It's Shiva just just being that container of pure awareness that you're trying to just get get back to. And I think it's to balance all this creative dynamism which we're hearing about and we know more about because mm -hmm. of the the interweb and, you know, social media, you know, better or worse. But um and so I, I, talk, I love Shakti because of the embracing of the body and how to use the body and not deny the body and, and see it as a, a container for healing. But I, I still have this, like, I want to go on a pilgrimage. I want to go see mm -hmm. the, the tantric adepts and the funeral pyres of India. I want to get sick, which everyone apparently does. All the Westerners who go to <laughs> India gets, like, I want to have that whole... Thing and then end up in an ashram somewhere and and totally deny the world and go completely and or you know <laughs> that pilgrimage like I don't think we get that much in the West we really have to seek it out and so I don't know if that like we're so you know because of the pandemic we're in our in our houses mm -hmm. you know it's in our face the whole time like finding the the space to um, engage in the practice, the more Shaivic practices, which I do think allow us to have that, just that pure consciousness. Yeah, container. I love the image of the Shiva and Shakti. And um, I think in, in mystic philosophy or in like comparative mystic philosophy, they talk about like imminent and transcendent. And something mm -hmm. we talked about in the demystifying mysticism episode number, whatever. But, um, yes. you know, imminent and transcendent. Those, those are the two qualities that you're talking about. Um, yes. Imminent meaning... Uh, the she the shakti the present the experiential mm -hmm. and transcendent being shiva the observer you know detached and so on and so that relationship is what sustains existence yeah. right yeah everything really yeah useful yeah. Where everything comes out of that yeah so yeah i think um that's why we're getting in part such a huge embracing of um mindfulness meditation meditation in general it's because there's so much shakti out there which is wonderful it's always just for me yeah. about balance and then refinement mm -hmm. right like yeah so yeah um, so true that, i don't feel like i gotta go travel the world though no nope, not feeling point. it, it comes, <laughs> no it i don't i inside when you sit i wanted to when i was younger and um I don't know. I I uh, I, I don't want to be too like spiritually pretentious, but the George Harrison, uh, you know, within you, without you, like yeah. without going out of your door, you know, yeah. you can yeah, yeah. know all the ways of heaven without, you know, it's like, I think there, there can be definitely usefulness to getting out yeah. there and mm -hmm. seeing things. And, and uh, actually um, speaking of that in, in uh, the film Scott and I worked on the kingdom within, we interviewed a uh, Catholic priest who, um, 
was incredibly uh, tolerant and inc- you know and it, that that those types of pilgrimage that you're talking about can open people up and it can really mm-hmm. like I knew he I had to get him in the film when I saw all of his like different worldly artifacts and like that can create a quality of tolerance and unity and progression and so on so mm-hmm. big encouraging yeah you know big, a lot of encouragement for me about that but but i'm good i think i'm yeah, all right no, no. <laughs> i'm just gonna <laughs> well, sit under a tree the, the baby. Yeah, and and i got be, a baby like, also maybe that's yeah actually. with the pandemic i think again uh i think everything kind of being so close it could just be like i i you know calgon take me away like i just want to mm-hmm. you know kind of be away from that a bit <laughs> But then yeah. also have, a, you know, I think this is where mindfulness does really help is just being able to be aware of the thoughts and, okay, this is just a thought, right. you know, it's not necessarily who you are. Clearly yeah. you can't, but I mean, I, 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 you've been on this path since very, since very, very young. Um, I've, I've had the interest in it, but really didn't start practicing yoga until gosh, my thirties. Yeah. Late twenties, thirties. So, mm. um, this just could be my progression where, Hey, pilgrimage is, is my next step. Totally. Yeah. So it's, it's either that it's where I should be, or I'm trying to get away from, from what's going on in the pandemic. I'm not sure. (laughs) I think it's beautiful though, that everyone's called to something different to your point, you and Bob just being so like-minded in a lot of things, but then feeling called differently. Reading the same books and (laughs) yeah. 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 And I'm aware that I don't even know what, what my next step is, whether, you know, like it's just up in, you know. Yeah. And I just, I just moved across the country because I have a wandering urges myself. So are you, you're not in Austin, are you? No, I, I, uh, I, uh, my wife and I were in Chicago and we just moved to Seattle like this week. So oh, wow. <laughs> Huge transition for us right now. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Amazing. You're like, um, Chicago winter's coming up. No. Yeah. And we were like, later. See ya. We're going to go where <laughs> there's, the forest. uh, where it never gets below like, you know, 40 degrees and there's just like moss so and gorgeous. evergreens. I know. Yeah. Around, so <laughs> yeah, we, we escaped. <laughs> yeah. It's Amazing. kind of the fairyland, uh, in, of America, you know, the lushness yeah. is in Ireland and I'm, thinking of the Celtic lore about the fairy people and you find yeah. them in the nooks and the crannies and in, in the moss laden forest. So maybe. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. I know it's like, it's something about all the, like the like islands and lakes and there's something about like that culture around islands specifically I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Cause like Japanese culture and Irish culture have that, mm. that strong, like fairy, uh, you know, mythology or, or, or culture but yeah it's i feel like we're in that now I, I i was like joking that it feels like we're living in harry potter because i can see like an <laughs> island and a mountain in the background and like fog so rolling amazing. in and so it's it's really yeah it's hitting the spot for me um just like experientially <laughs> so oh that's great it's yeah strange. and then you're right there's just that magic component i mean all of this aside like i think i embrace this philosophy over so many others I've read just there's a magic element like I just like I love the I love the the rational mind as the you know kind of western tradition has developed it nothing against yeah. the east you know I think they presaged it with the Hindu seers but um yeah the I just think it has a magic to it because it embraces the the eminent you know the the eminent mm. and the transcendent so mm. Yeah, so that's great. congratulations. That sounds great. Maybe where oh, I really thanks. just want to go is Seattle. No, not <laughs> <laughs> we got some mountains you can climb. Yeah, yeah, you can climb. Yeah, just. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the pandemic, um, what are some activity? And you know, this is work from home world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we're still indefinite and go back to the office. And so we've been trying to, you know, with our org and our club, um, try to keep being, you know, evangelicals of mindfulness, sort of. Mm -hmm. I feel like Mm -hmm. I should preface that, too, by saying, like, 
our uh, like the theme we always bring up is like we're just creating a space like maybe we say that to the point where we're, <laughs> like psychotically we're like no we're just creating a space it's okay um but what you know what we're trying to do with the club is like get these people that work very hard um and long hours and so on to do it from a place of presence and calmness and clarity and because it's you know these practices have transformed our lives and um it has some challenges with zoom world as you know um being that you're especially because you're all about sound that's another thing i mean sound through the conference call the sound bath is we can't do them frankly yeah. um the singing bowls it's all about the reverberation on the walls and in your bones and um you know so talk to us about that change right now like the intermission if you will from the in-person and and maybe some techniques that transcend the environment yeah that oh, that is i haven't had that so much because um with the resiliency work um a lot of it is uh i mean i do a lot of facial massage because like i was talking about with the ventral that innervates mm. the face so you end up toning it backwards because your work, you know, just with facial massage, the nerves there, you work them, it tones the, the ventral vagus nerve is, is the idea behind that. Um, I have done several classes there of the resiliency classes where um, I'll encourage people to chant and I'll sort of, like you said, be the container. Like here is what we're going to do is you inhale on the O for five, counts excuse me inhale for five counts and then exhale ohm for 10 and they're usually in a space where they can do that you know because mm. they're at home so that's actually worked out pretty well um and that's then cool. yeah they feel it, uncomfortable chanting ohm yeah in the conference room yeah exactly um in that respect i think the chanting has done better in this because people are yep yeah, they don't have to feel um, as constrained and they can do it as, as softly or as loudly. And, you know, the nature of sound um, is, and uh, this is Anna Dea Judith's work, who I love, love, love her. Um, there's like four different types of sound and, you know, one, only one is audible. And then it's the other can have, the others, the inaudible ones can have, as profound an effect as the audible ones and so what i tell students mm. that they don't feel comfortable chanting audibly just to say ohm to themselves and sort of imagine that they're just owning the rooms of the spaces of their mind you know kind of cleaning wow. out yeah with very the, interesting yeah and and um you know my wife would be concerned if she heard me chanting ohm, ohm in my yeah office across yeah. the house <laughs> yeah my uh daughter and husband are like what are you doing <laughs> yeah yeah it's my bag it's my bag because every single time i do it i get that autonomic response that and inevitably after i'm done i'm just clearer and calmer okay you know that was so gonna be my question i wanted yeah. to know like is it an immediate relief or i just also for anyone that's listening that's yeah. thought about chanting i've personally yeah. always been intimidated by it and so yeah. you've the you've been the one that turned me on to chanting oh, and so yeah. um i just would love to hear more about the i guess the benefits yeah like yeah, is it more immediate up, for yeah. you yeah um so there's uh, there is a huge science uh so back you know back to kind of the philosophy um you know we have shakti which is you know the the power creation the the sort of feminine power creation eminence like you said and so she's a life force and then you guys have heard about prana which is you know linked to the breath and it's also has a life force component and in this philosophy like prana is prana and shakti are like mother and and child, you know, like Shakti is the mother, and then we have Prana. And then um, Prana goes through um, the nadis, which are, you know, those, the nadis in the, in the body, it's an energetic body concept. And they're, they're kind of, um, you know, just little offshoots, if you think about them as, as uh, like receptors. maybe nerves. Huh? Receptors, like receptors? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and nadi actually comes from nada, which means sound. And so I think by um, the actual sound, the sound bowls, 
you know, they, the science behind that is the, that the sound reverberates, like our, our bones have a crystalline nature and then those those bowls have a crystalline nature and they mm. resonate and then you get that. So I think chanting audibly, you can also feel that. Um, the audible chants work really well for me. And I, uh, so there's some science there about, I think that they work on an energetic level by um, uh, stimulating the nadis and stimulating mm. prana um, uh, and uh, you know, I know that there's an acoustic science behind it and I haven't explored that as much because so much of it for me is experiential. It regulates sure, my nervous yeah. system immediately. I have a profound effect, uh, a profound experience of just being, <laughs> for me, just being calmer and um, more, more at peace so that whatever I'm doing the next uh, activity I'm doing, I, there isn't as much like, oh, you could be doing this or why aren't you yeah. doing this? Or, you know, I can just be more present. So, That's beautiful how it resonates with you. I mean, I feel like, yeah. especially, I'm actually curious too, the vibration whenever in the back of your throat, is there <laughs> some kind of inherent benefit for you whenever you feel that in your body? Yeah. Well, um, so back to the vagus nerve research. Yeah. So ohm is a is a huge piece of that, and I think it also, or I know it also from the research I've done, it stimulates the vagus nerve. So you know, again, by stimulating the vagus nerve, the both ventral and dorsal, you're um, I, I feel like you're just promoting wellness throughout the entire body. Like you're vibrating down into your heart and your lungs, so you're breathing better and. And I, I think it also just helps the, the, the heart to just be <laughs> calm, you know, like it, it yeah. calms that, that all the, the, I, maybe perhaps the shadow side of the heart, which is the longing and the, and the, um, you know, sort of emotionality that's not refined. Um, and yeah. so. I think it has a direct correlate. That's a great question. And maybe. this is a stress creator and that's a, Distress can accumulate and uh, cause yeah. heart disease. That's, yes. Stress is tied to a lot of different illnesses. Heart disease is a b yeah. brutal killer in America. So very relevant. Yeah. And I, I think what I was just going to add to to that piece is, um, you know, why I so enjoy Marie's work is because it's so tangible and noticeable. Um, you know, most meditation practices do take a lot of time, over time, sequential, incremental to feel the benefits. And I think yours takes less time. You know, yours can actually, you can actually feel the tangible uh, impacts and effects um, within that session or the end of that same session. Um, you know, it's not going to be this dramatic, complete night and day transformation. But, but I remember one time you were saying, um, I think it was even at the beginning, of one of your meditations about uh, posture and spine you know, you, you want to have a relaxed posture. And I was, I was taught by the Kriyavan to uh, be straight up, always be straight up. And I think over time that that uh, started to lean forward more uh, yeah. just over the years. And you were like, make sure you're leaning back a little bit. It was fine straight, but like leaning back because that isn't that an autonomic um, it is. Or sympathetic. Yeah. I love yeah. that. You j I feel like you just and it was, that question. Yeah. It was clear. I mean, as yeah. soon as I did that, I was like, oh, my God, this is way different mm -hmm. than yeah. kind of that more intensive, focused, overly, you know, it really loosened up everything. So, it, yeah. yeah, I've had a few experiences with your work where it's really noticeable. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Wow. Yeah. Um, the what I've been reading recently about the spine is that we're and I think you'll dig this is. You're right. Like uh, Rosenberg talks about, you know, we're pitching forward so much on the screens, right? And then he talks about forward head position. And when the head isn't stacked over the spine, it is a it creates a sympathetic response. And you know that can just be cumulative. You know, like everything's going great. Why am Why am I like jumpy or something? Or mm -hmm. and it could just be that your head is You're leaning forward for six leaning hours forward. of the day. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. That's so, so interesting. The wow. spine, um, it should be upright and erect, but not rigid. And then the work I've been doing recently is it, 
it's feeling kind of the buoyancy of the spine. You know, we've got the vertebrae and then we've got the discs in between the vertebrae and it's, there's a watery element to it. So it's allowing just for the spine to get that sense of, of wateriness. And then the spine is made up of these curves. So hmm. it's feeling that versus like, I'm a ballerina in meditation. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you don't want to be all down because that drops the heart. And I think that's probably where mm -hmm. those sages are like, let's be uplifted um, in our heart. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Can you lead one? Yeah. Here yeah, on the end of our, maybe, and then come back to fave books. Yes. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, so go ahead and close your eyes. And um, probably already know this, but the closing of the eyes really is the first nod to the parasympathetic nervous system because obviously if there's a tiger you're not like Shankara to face the tiger down <laughs> um, there's not a tiger so we can close our eyes and feel safe um, so it it's a nod to the nervous system that you're safe and and um, you can relax and so there's a placement part of this and you the first is you work from the ground up, so feet are on the floor, um, as connected as you can be to the floor. And the pelvic bones and the sitting bones are heavy. So that takes an inhale, or an exhale, excuse me. So you inhale and you feel a sense of elongation in the spine, and then you exhale and there's a sense of weight, of surrender, of, you know, kind of letting go. And this isn't about perfection. You know, if you can let go just a little bit, it's plenty. And then on that, we place the spine and it's bringing awareness of your spine. So, a good way to do that is just to gently move forward and backwards. And, and while you're doing that, just being aware of, of your spine, of how it moves, of how it feels. So, to this idea of felt sense, like what is your felt sense of your own spine in your body? And then coming to a place of stillness where there's a sweet spot, where you get that sense of you're upright, but you're not rigid. And can you tap into a sense of buoyancy in the spine? And then onto that, bring your awareness to your shoulder blades let them move gently towards each other on the back and that lifts the heart a little bit and then you incorporate that into your 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 buoyant spine and just breathing normally here it's wherever your breath lands in your body And feeling here, just kind of playing because the work is, is about the spirit of the laboratory and playing with different things in your body. Um, just finding that way to get 5% more comfortable. And then on to that, we place the head. So noticing where your head is right now is the chin sort of jutting out, it's the head moving over the body. And most all of us can benefit from bringing it back just a little bit. And by doing that, noticing if there isn't a sense of release, And like all work, kind of like yoga, the effect of this becomes cumulative because you bring greater awareness each time you do it. So, and then from here, moving up, like 
there's the jaw and you let the jaw go soft. Yes, nice. And the brow is soft. And notice the placement of your hands. And then bringing the right hand up to the heart center and then the left hand over the right. So the heart center is the breastbone. And so this is a mudra seal. And it's just one of love and self-acceptance. And so just tapping into that for a moment. Um, the bhakti, the devotional, the love but or and really the, the love of self the knowledge of self as part of the divine really one with the divine non-dual and imagine as you inhale you're infusing your hands with this energy and a lot of times you may see a color or colors here the heart chakra has the colors light green and rose associated with it you can call those to your mind's eye or your mind's screen really um, and kind of get a, 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 a deepening experience so I like to infuse the hands and then you move the hands down to under the belly and next we're moving into diaphragmatic breathing and as you inhale the belly will expand in all directions and as you exhale it will fall down fall back in rather and just moving into this intention of taking that heart energy that love in your own heart that you've infused your hands with and and having it now infuse your diaphragm infuse the rest of your body your breathing apparatus so that healing spreads to the entire body through the circulatory system Just be here for, let's do it for a minute, I'm guided, where you're feeling the sensation here and the thoughts are going to come with that, just bringing the attention back to the sensation. How good it feels to breathe in your body, what a gift is and what a link it is to your life force. And then just staying in this kind of, I like to think of it as a magical experience that you're creating with your own breath. Magic in the sense of miraculous, you're miraculously healing, you're miraculously becoming aware of your connection to the divine. And now we're just going to do some facial massage, which is always a crowd pleaser. Um, we start with the SCM muscle. This is the sterno, sternocliad mastoid muscle. Um, I can walk you through it. You can keep your eyes closed if you like. If you feel like you need to open them, go for it. But what you'll do is turn your head to the right to start and uh, thumb and and 
index finger and when you turn to the right you'll notice this ridge that happens it connects with the clavicle and kind of goes up to the back of the head and you're just going to use the thumb and the the index finger and you're massaging that so this up at the top you, it uh, connects to those cranial nerves and will help to tone really massage but tone by virtue of massage this area uh, the the vagus nerve so grabbing along that ridge and then coming back to the center and then doing it on the second side so again you turn the head you feel the ridge it's really like a tendon and the muscle around that is the SCM. And you're using the thumb and then the four fingers to kind of pinch in there. And you're looking for the sensation of kind of a good ouch, like a, from a good massage. So good. Yeah, that's good stuff. And there's some, um, I know, speaking of the value of sound, of the that's a podcast and you can you can um, Google this on YouTube, just like SCM massage. You need to see it again. And then coming back to the center, and then we get into the scalenes, which are on the sides of the neck. And just whatever way, whatever your body says feels good. So um, while you're doing that, again, this work is about toning the vagus nerve and we're doing it indirectly because the ventral vagus nerve innervates the face and the throat so by working with that and then you come up to the jaw and then just moving the bottom part of the jaw just massaging around there so you have all these nerves right and then it's if you can just use your thumbs right under the chin and then gently down the front of the throat, which is the thyroids there. That's a important energy center, throat center. And then back up to where the TMJ is, right? So that's where the the cheekbones meet the jawbone. It's for most of us, I like to take the the uh, index fingers and push in there just to get kind of a release right at the TMJ and this usually opens up the sinuses yeah and I tend to do this a little intensely because I've been doing it for a while so just start it's always that like push a little bit but not too much and then from there you just massage underneath the cheekbones Again, this not this notion that this can really be done anywhere for the most part. I've done it while driving. I don't recommend that, but you know, <laughs> like, I'm a weirdo. And then- Please do not operate a motor vehicle while- Yes, exactly. How you kind of complete this is you, you work around the eyes and then the temples and and then the you use the the fingers and really working the scalp here and using the thumbs to um, massage the occipital ridge and the occiput down and then the back of the neck and so you're like Marie this is massage like what's going on but so again so much of it is intention and the intention is the knowledge of that that the vagus nerve is innervating the face and the throat and so by massaging them you're having an effect a positive effect on the vagus nerve so that is and then I just want to do one more thing which is a Rosenberg thing sorry Bob. that's okay really this. this is great you Beautiful. look forward, so just you're looking forward, and then you're just gonna look to the right, and it's not, you don't move your head, you just look to the right, and then you're, you're um, 
ear comes towards your right shoulder blade. And you hold this until you get an autonomic response. So that's the yawning or the eye watering or a swallow or a sigh. And once you get that, you come back to the center and do it to the left and then down. Did you get an eyes water? Yeah. Yeah, good. Do you mind re-explaining what that means? I'm so sorry. No, oh, that's okay. Yeah, when every rating come out that. So eyes watering is autonomic. Um, and it's connected often with yawning. Like, I don't know if you guys experience this, but sometimes when I yawn, then my eyes start watering. Mm -hmm. um, and it just means that the parasympathetic and this one meaning of it is the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems are regulating. So most of us are in sympathetic, which is the fight or flight um, in some form. I mean, we're not being chased by the lion, but, um, you know, there's this constant stress, right? <laughs> the stress for whatever reason so it keeps us up here. And um, this work, telling the vagus nerve will regulate. So it'll downregulate so that we're not so much in fight or flight, we're more in rest and digest. So it kind of just equalizes it, regulates it. Mm. Yeah. So that, that, and then, so that's, these are sort of physical forms of exercise. And then there is the sounding, which, um, you know, there's so much out there on, on chanting and sounding. There's resonant sounds, there's chanting, but I find that this work, you just get an immediate effect, you know, it's a small effect, even at, you know, you do it two or three times a day for five minutes and that's not a lot of time. And it's, I find it increases my productivity and sense of well-being. Absolutely. Thanks. I just feel more connected. Yeah. Yeah. You're not like, yeah, I have to so do much. everything now all by myself. <laughs> you know? Like, no, I can go and take a walk and come back and yeah. do it. So. Yeah. Thank you for, I thank feel you for so going blissful. through that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel great. So glad. But again, don't drive while yeah. doing that. <laughs> Actually, don't. I Disclaimer. Say yeah. Disclaimer. I mean, like you can massage your neck when you're at a stoplight. Not, yeah. probably not while driving, right? But, you know. Do so responsibly. When do you, yes. yeah, yeah, when do you do this? Morning or all the time or Throughout night? the day. Yeah. 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 So my personal practice is in the morning, I chant the lum, bum, rum. They're ones for each chakra. Again, very easy to find online. Um, and then a lot of oming. Um, so I get the autonomic responses because I'm not a morning person. Like I wake up and I'm like, what the heck? I get, like I must be out on the astral plane at night, like fighting. <laughs> I don't wake up happy. <laughs> Same, yeah. This astral. Um, so I think again, I'm not, also with I must the, be not on the astral because I'm very sharp in the morning. <laughs> you do. You I'm an earth creature. Yeah. Your astral plane fighting is maybe later in the day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so another thing I think that sounding does, um, so there's resonant sounds and there's chanting and resonant sounds are just vowel sounds, um, but they're awesome. And that's how I can kind of, sell people on chanting it's like we're not chanting we're sounding it's resonant sounds it's vowel sounds you know it's, so and then yeah then that's they, different yeah yeah everyone's afraid of having to sing that's like one of people's biggest fears so i feel like this is kind of so yeah the resonant sound sounds less like uh chant you know chanting yeah. or singing i could see that <laughs> yeah and um again i think what ultimately keeps people with it especially they're like what is this um is that they do get um, an immediate response and uh, an immediate effect. And some of the books on the vagus nerve, they talk a lot about singing and humming will also tone this vagus nerve. And everybody knows like, whistle while you work or the people who are humming always say, you know, and, and you can experiment with this. It's why it's so great. It's like, you just take a five minute walk and hum, you'll come back in a different state of consciousness than mm. probably than when you left and that's also a great sell for the dudes because dudes are like i don't really want to massage my face right now <laughs> or you know like mm. i don't want to necessarily chant but i can get into humming you know yeah they're humming while they're working they're being unprofessional yeah <laughs> that's right there's something wrong but you can hum and walk right so 
I just feel like it burns away the dross of being overly sleepy. Like it just tunes my instruments. So but yeah. this stuff I do just throughout the day and um, really started it and embraced it to try and get away from always wanting the coffee or the tea or the mm. caffeine, you know, which I don't, you know, again, I don't think it's a huge deal, but if you're overusing it, it can be, it can be something to look at, to refine. You take that back. Right I'm now. So sorry. <laughs> I know coffee is Brahma, right? Like coffee I'm... is the absolute. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sad because I'm out. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, I got to go. So. Tell us. Uh, yeah, I really do. Uh, to get more coffee. <laughs> but also I've got a baby. Um, but yeah, no. <laughs> Give us uh, some fave books and teachers on the way out. Marie, you've dropped a few gems throughout yes. the show. Throughout the episode. Yes, you do. What, are some, uh, what, what, is, what would you say like one or two maybe that like really explain the psychosomatic you know i mm -hmm. i, I, I oh, know yeah. especially these two are real into the scientific connections with all this crazy yeah philosophy. so um let's see okay so a really big one right now is accessing the healing power of the vagus there you go <laughs> yep wow. um, this is stanley rosenberg um these are very simple exercises. A lot of them working mm -hmm. with the eye stuff because optic nerve is, is, mm -hmm. you know, connected back there. And, um, mm -hmm. I like it because it dovetails nicely into another one of my favorite authors, which is Anadea Judith. So this is chakra yoga. And in here she has yoga eyes and it's just moving the eyes um, all around and it's that connection um, in, and I think it's the connection to the vagus nerve ultimately, but you know, there, again, the, the experiential part I think is the, the proofs in the pudding. So I love that. There's love some it. great science in there. And then Sally Kempton. Yes. Awakening Shakti. So this, you get to play with, um, the goddesses uh, in the pantheon and invoke them and use chanting to invoke them mm -hmm. if you so desire. Beautiful. Um, Kali, yeah. Tara. You said it. Durga. Durga. Lakshmi, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Saraswati, which I think you would really dig is the. Saraswati. Yeah. Saraswati. That's right. That's right. Um, she likes to, she's the goddess of speech, of good speech. Mm. Yeah, among other things. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. oh, Marie, I feel like I so learned much. so much. Yeah, I, I know. know. <laughs> Thank you guys. Me too. Me too. That's so that's... practical as well. Yeah. Yeah, you're uh, such an expert at the at the scientific, the nerve endings and all those qualities alongside the yoga philosophy it's a very rare combination of expertise so thank, thank you. you so much absolutely oh always so much to learn uh, thank you guys so much for this podcast i thank love you it. no i i feel so blessed. yeah yeah <laughs> no i was gonna say i feel like we're so blessed because we just got to learn so much from you to bob's point like your expertise is insane and it's awesome just oh. be it's just so beautiful hearing you teach us so thank oh, you thank you Thanks so much. Come back and see us in the future. I will, guys. Thank you. Have a great uh, holiday season. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, you too. Namaste. Appreciate it. Great to meet you, Namaste. Scott. You go too. Sag, go Sag. Yes. <laughs> yes. And Cuspians. And Cuspians. Bye, guys. Thanks again. Cancers are okay, too. Cancers don't get... That's why you're so simple eh, and you right. love the tequila. That's why. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Marie just called I mean, you out. Hunter S. Thompson, come on, Hemingway. Like, of course, they let's not go that direction, but <laughs> drunk they, writers. They, they are the the great, amazing writers, are uh, <laughs> cancers. It's the soul stuff. Oh, that's so cool. I dig that's it. Amazing. I dig it. Amazing. Much love, Marie. Thank you. So much love for you. you.